looking at this, um, this word for be watchful, which of course is a verb, but it's to be watchful. Here in, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, uh, we have these words, but the end of all things is at hand. Now, th that's talking about uh, the uh, uh, judgment. That's talking about the final day, a final judgment, that it is at hand. It will be arriving. And exactly when, we cannot know. Peter, who's an inspired writer, could not know. Uh, Jesus, at, when he was on this earth, said he didn't know. But it's at hand, meaning it approaches how far away is it? Well, we should always treat it as though it is soon. And when I say that, it, that's precisely what is being stated here. Because Therefore, because of that, because the end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. So there's three words we want to look at this. Look in this sentence. The first one is serious, and we understand what that means. Being sober-minded taking things in a serious way, not in jest, not mocking, but something that is meant to be taken seriously, we take it seriously. And there's nothing greater of greater importance in our life than serving God. And there is nothing more frightening in our entire existence than hell. There's nothing of being cast away eternally. There's no greater concern than God's wrath upon us. Be sober or be serious. Now, we come to the next word in this, and that is watchful. But the third word is prayers. Serious and watchful in your prayers. Well, you're to be serious. We are to be serious because the end of all things is at hand. And we're to be watchful because the end of all things is at hand. And all this goes into our prayers, being serious and watchful in our prayers. Now, what are we to be watchful for? Well, the first thing we want to make mention in this is obviously having in mind that the day of judgment looms. The day of judgment is inevitable. And there's no escaping it. It may be today, it may be tomorrow, it may not come till next year, it may not come for another 300, 400, 5,000 years. <laughs> we don't know. It doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Because what matters is that if we are watchful for it, if we are being serious about it, that it will not catch us off guard. Obviously, if it is you know, too many years away, we will not continue to be on this earth like so many billions of others have, not, have, have died before the day of judgment. We'll be just like them. But our lives will be closed. Now a, a, a written book, our lives would be a fully written book. And our, we will be judged by what we have done. We'll be judged. And there is a watchfulness that must take place. But here, this particular word, Greek word, here in uh, 1 Peter 4 and verse 7, that, and I'm reading from the New King James, and it is rendered as watchful and watchful in your prayers. But the word is, is a verb, what, to be watchful. It actually has a root. It actually means to be sober and actually means to be temperate, though there is another word for temperate. It does, but they share the same root word. It does also mean one who is not drinking wine. I mean, that, that's, it's that specific. One who is not drinking anything that that's, has alcohol in it. And the truth of the matter is, if we are to be serious and watchful, how can that be done if, if we're hitting the bottle? How can that be done? Well, it can't be. How can that be done and we be 
uh, taken at least a little bit, at least partially, by alcohol. Now, we've t spoken about this on occasions, in that uh, it is a, uh, alcohol has a function, and it's not something that is for social drinking. That's, it's not something just for, for casual use. It's not meant for that at all. It does have a function. Uh, but it's not for that. Just like morphine has a function and other things in creation have a function, but it's not meant to be ingested casually and perhaps some things not meant to be ingested at all. But let's go and look at just being watchful, just that idea of being watchful. We go to Matthew chapter 25, first parable that one might think of. Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 1, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who, virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. So this is, this is a tradition in the first century, first century Palestine, of uh, the, the wedding. And uh, here you have these uh, friends uh, waiting for the wedding. There, there are ten of them. Five are wise, five are foolish. Verse 3, Then though, those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So we have uh, the, the foolish ones. They didn't bring enough oil. The wise ones they brought enough oil. They brought enough for the weight because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take waiting. There's no knowing when the bridegroom would return. He may return very quickly. He may arrive very quickly and there's no need for much oil or any oil at all. And, it, and there we are. Or it may be quite prolonged where the, the waiting is, is going to be hours and not minutes. And there's going to be the need to, to be ready, to be prepared. And all of this speaks, one, of like so many other parables, of the unpredictability of the one who's going to be returning. In this case, it's the bridegroom. And other times, it is a, uh, uh, the, the owner of the, the property or the, the master of the vineyard or the one who went out and became a king. They return. The master of the servants, he's gone, delivered them the talents, He's gone. How long's he gone? Well, uh, protracted. It's a, a, a fair amount of time. But he will be returning, and then he judges uh, his servants as to what they did. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So they're looking at the long term. But while the bridegroom was delayed, verse 4, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. So here is this point at which the bridegroom returns, you have the, the wise ones, they've got the oil. They can, they can be at the wedding and all everything that goes around the, uh, the, the wedding, they can be there. But these foolish ones, they did not bring what was necessary. And now they've got to, they've got to leave and, and buy what they can buy. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. It's shut. And now there's no way to get in. And in the, what, in the meaning of all this, that is a tragic thing to be on the outside of that door. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. 
Watch, verse 13, the first word, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And I will say this for the benefit of anyone who might be watching this in the future. No one can know when Christ will return. No one. Everyone who has attempted it has been made, they made themselves into a fool because it didn't happen. This, goes, this is a, a mistake made numerous times through history of those who thought they knew when Christ would return and they were wrong. Anyone who says they know when Christ is going to return is lying or they're mad because you can't know. I can know that it's sometime in the future. That's what we're told. But there is no knowing the day. There is no knowing the day whatsoever. But if we live each day as though it were the final day of judgment. The day of judgment would be coming sometime that day. That's being watchful. If we lived every week that way, if we lived moment to moment with the expectation that Jesus will return, and we don't know when, but if we are watchful in that way, then we're doing precisely what 1 Peter 4 is calling us to do. We're doing precisely what the Matthew 25 and verse 13 is calling us to do. Watch therefore. And in this parable, as we have said, I'm changing the illustration or the analogy a bit, this isn't a sprint and it's not necessarily a short run, but this is a marathon that we're running. The race that we're running, uh, however long we're here upon the earth, we're running that race. And we have to be prepared for the years. And we have to be prepared for day in, day out, watchfulness, day in, day out of carrying the, our cross, day in, day out, doing the work of the church and doing it without grumbling, without murmuring, without any of that, doing what God has called us to do. That's what we commit ourselves to. That's what we've, we've been called to do. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3, we have Sardis the dead church, as Jesus describes them as dead. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. That's verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent, therefore, if you will not watch. I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Now, his hour that he comes upon them is not final judgment, but it will be judgment on them. Jesus doesn't wait for final judgment to withhold all judgment. What do I mean by that? Jerusalem, A.D. 70. Jesus was reigning in heaven, had been reigning in heaven for 40 years. Jerusalem is destroyed, A.D. 70, and he described it in Matthew 23 as judgment come upon them. He describes it that way. And Jesus, having been described as ruling the nations with a rod of iron, doesn't mean he can't or will not use that rod of iron until it's the day of judgment. He'll use it whenever he needs to use it, whenever he wills to use it. That's exactly when he will use it, the rod of iron. So 
He, this can be for an individual. This could be for a group such as a congregation in Sardis. This can be for an entire nation, as he said he could and would do. Now, he's calling them to be watchful. To be watchful has another, there's another part of this watchfulness. We've discussed it as, as that of, of watching for his return and that will have an effect on our lives. And it's a positive effect. But there's another watchfulness and it's, a, it's all part of the, the same thing. And that is a watchfulness of being alert, not being asleep, of actually it is being fully awake and, and exactly as rendered here, being watchful. Okay, so that's, that's a different Greek word being used here. The first Greek word had as part of it, part of, of, of that word did mean to be sober and it does mean the one who, who is not drinking alcohol. It does mean that. But it also has the, the fact of being watch, watchful and being sober while watching. You're not going to be very good watchman while being drunk. But this next word here in Revelation chapter 3, and it's used twice here, is from a word to be fully awake, to be to uh, one who is fully aware and just uh, aware of things. And to be aware of this situation means to correct that situation. What was the situation in Sardis? They're a dead congregation. Spiritually dead. Spiritually doing nothing. Nothing. And he tells them that they have to strengthen what remains. And from the description there, not a whole lot remained. And he calls them to, to be watchful and watchful concerning themselves, watchful concerning what's happening around them, yes. But watchful concerning their own spiritual welfare. Now, let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5. And this, of course... Uh, chapter 4, 2 Timothy 4, begins with, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His, appoint, as it, as it, at his appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season. So he, this, of course, is addressed to Timothy. Verse 5, he says, But you be watchful in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Okay. This is not meant just for Timothy. It goes beyond Timothy. This also goes beyond this idea of being watchful in all things. goes beyond preachers or evangelists. It's more than that. Because we've already seen from Matthew chapter 25 by parable form, from uh, revelation of God speaking to an entire congregation, and from uh, uh, starting off in 1 Peter of addressing Christians, that we are to be watchful. And this particular word does mean that it's, it's actually the, the same word that we find in 1 Peter 4 and 7, and it means to be sober. And this is to watch in sobriety, watch with a seriousness, watch fully aware and fully awake, not drowsy. Of course, that, that would be in that other word, to be fully awake, but not your, your mind being at its, at its fullest, not being dampened down by anything, but that this is a serious matter that must be regarded wholeheartedly. Now, if we go to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, I just want you to see something because uh, this same word to, uh, that we've been looking at, which is rendered watchful, that has the uh, same root as uh, we find in uh, 1 Timothy 3 
And verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of, of one wife. You have temperate, then sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. That word temperate that is there has that same root word of, of, that we find rendered watchful. has the same root word, temperate of someone who, who doesn't, isn't drinking. He's, he's not, he doesn't imbibe, as we may say. He's, he's not part of that at all. Uh, now, let's go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we will see this, where both of them are, both ideas are actually being brought together. And I'll show you what I mean. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Here, both ideas brought together. Let's, we are to be watchful and we are to be sober. Sober-minded, as 1 Peter 4, 7 made mention of being serious while watching. What does the future hold? I don't know. What part, what will happen to each of us in the future? I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what the rest of this day holds. There's no knowing any of that. But I can know some things that God has told all of us, all of us, that things in this world will progressively get worse and worse. Now, there are times, there are times when things can improve a bit. But generally speaking, generally speaking, things get worse and worse. That's why sometimes I wonder, we've been talking about the flood Sunday morning. I wonder if what was going on prior to the flood, if we haven't exceeded that in violence and in just wickedness, if we have exceeded that. I don't know. I don't know how wicked they actually were as compared to us. Sometimes I wonder, have we not exceeded what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah? Have we not done that as well? And uh, sometimes I wonder if, if we haven't gone well past that. And one would ask, well, why doesn't God just destroy everything right now? Well, first off, Christ gives time. And he gives opportunity, the message to go out to the next person. The next person being able to repent of their sins, become a better person, and at their obedience. That obedience leads to baptism. At, at their obedience, they are brought into his church, and one more person is saved. One more is saved. God allows things to continue by His long-suffering. It's always been the case. He allows things to continue so the gospel can spread still to further and find people that one would never have thought would have cared a thing about the gospel. Such as when Paul is arrested and he is taken to Rome, uh, in all that, he preaches, he does preach to Roman governors. He does uh, Felix and Festus. He does preach uh, to Herod and, uh, and uh, Bernice. He does preach to evidently the household of Caesar once he makes it to Rome to where some of the household of Caesar now are Christians. That's the household of Nero. Some in Nero's household, don't know who, heard the gospel because of Paul. So if we were to think of the Roman Empire as being just, I mean, that's wicked enough, destroy the world, there would be people there of the household of Nero who would have never heard the gospel. But they did hear it and they did respond. 
And there would be others who had their opportunity to hear it, and they responded in the wrong direction. But they still had their opportunity. They still had the time, the same message that goes out to everyone, and time to respond to it. Being watchful understands that the clock is ticking. Being watchful understands that things are going to be happening and we're going to be held responsible for, for how we have lived our lives. We can stand before God, we can stand before Him, innocent, because He's made us that way. Holy, because He's made us that way. A child of God, because He's made us that way. And in following Him, we do His will and He promises the blessings. And the blessings are going to be salvation. The blessings are going to be a fellow heir with Christ, a brother or sister with Christ, and heaven as being an eternal home. And it is beyond heaven. You know, we can, we can get so caught up in Renaissance paintings of heaven or other depictions of heaven and, and not really think about what heaven actually is. Heaven is beyond our imagination. All we've got to do is just read the last part of Revelation and see that heaven is really beyond what we can imagine and beyond uh, even rendering into an image. It's beyond that. Uh, to do so is, to, is to, to kind of freeze it into something that it's not or make it into something that it's not. That it is, it's beyond anything on this earth. And as much as I can use my imagination to think of heaven as this place that is of splendor and opulence and fantastic, my imagination still is limited. God's is not. Being watchful, understanding that time is, is limited, not just our imagination, but time is limited, and knowing that God expects us in the time that we have to serve Him and to love Him. The one who loves us is the one also that wants us to serve Him. The one who is King of kings and Lord of lords cannot be deposed. No one can conquer His kingdom. No one can take, can strip that king, kingship away from Him. He can't be assassinated. Uh, nothing. He is in eternal power. Until he returns, the, until he gives the kingdom back to the, to the Father, and that it belongs to him. And he will use his power as he sees fit. Therefore, be watchful. Therefore, be sober and vigilant or sober and watchful in your prayers. And a prayerful attitude is one that has a heart focused on God. It's that simple. We ask this evening that we look at our own lives, look at how we're leading our lives, and we all need to be sober, to be serious, and to be watchful, mindful of everything that has been promised everything that has been warned. This evening, if you need to respond to the invitation, we ask that you come as we stand and sing.